everybody. We're going to get started. Workers in jobs that pay $10.50 an hour or less are considered low wage. Two thirds of low wage workers are women. Women account for 30% of all small business owners. But they receive only 16% of traditional small business loans, only 17% of small business administration loans, and only 7% of venture capital funds. In fact, when businesses are started, those owned by women have half as much capital as those owned by men. And the statistic we're all familiar with, women who work full time year round get paid 79 cents for every dollar that their male counterparts make. But that number is only part of the story. Compared to their white, non-Hispanic male peers, the wage gap is 55 cents to the dollar for Hispanic women and 60 cents for black women. These numbers only begin to tell the story of why we are here today. Welcome to the fourth annual NYU Law Women's Summit. My name is Jessica Moldovan. My colleague Ryan Harper and I are the executive co-chairs of NYU Law Women. And we are delighted to welcome all of you to NYU today to discuss a topic of pressing national importance, economic equality for women. Law Women promotes the academic success and professional development of women at NYU School of Law and advocates for women's rights more broadly. Our 100 plus committee members work hard to connect over 300 students in peer mentor pairs, bring accomplished alums to campus, establish our first ever high school mentoring program, spotlight the activism of women seeking justice around the world, and strengthening ties to the New York City legal community. As schools around the country grapple with questions related to diversity and inclusion, Law Women seeks to give voice to the concerns of women students and provide forums for them to express their views. Today's event is one such forum. This election year, even more than most, our nation is debating how economic policies hold us back. Today's experts will propose new policies and innovative frameworks that will empower women instead of hamper them. We will learn about the history that shaped today's restraints and the developments in other countries that can inform our future. We will debate together changes to the tax code, initiatives towards equal pay, and improved access to capital for women entrepreneurs. Most importantly, we hope the sheer weight of expertise and attendance will fuel conversations and connections that can help make these new policies a reality, no matter who wins the election this fall. None of this would be possible today without our industrious and illustrious summit committee chairs, Olivia Green, Lily Alston, and Sequoia Call, and the entire committee of students who put this amazing day together. Thank you. And thank you to Sarah Bowman, who quite literally makes everything happen. And last but not least, Dean Morrison, a scholar of constitutional law, former advisor to the White House, and a clerk for the notorious RBG. <laughs> Dean Morrison is, most importantly, what we at, in law women call a cool dude, <laughs> a true ally to women students. Please join us in welcoming Dean Morrison. Cool dude. Well, that's the best title so far. Um, I'm not sure either of my daughters would agree, but I will, I will take it. Um, thanks, Ryan and Jess, for that great introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here this morning. Let me apologize for the informality of the dress. I joke with people that if I'm not wearing a tie, it means I'm not going to ask anybody for money on that day. Uh, that's tr that happens to be true today, so you're all safe in that regard. Uh, it's also a travel day for me. I have to head to the West Coast after class, but I'm really glad to be able to be here uh, to join with you in really celebrating the convening of this uh, extremely important uh, summit on this very timely and important topic. Uh, I really could not be more thrilled with the leadership of Law Women. This is a tremendously important organization here at the law school for our current students and our graduates as well. Um, and has proven again and again with this summit, once again, uh, that it has the capacity and the inclination to be a real thought leader on issues that matter in the world, on issues at the intersection of law and public policy, um, and that affect everyone in our community in real ways, but that go beyond our community too, and are issues of truly national and even international significance. Now this particular topic, um, economic equality or the problems of economic inequality and uh, public policy possibilities for addressing it is 
deeply important and timely. Uh, I, I don't think that the leaders of Wild Women could have known that this, we would be convening this at a moment where, quite literally, the future of all three branches of the federal government is at stake. Um, and where in many ways uh, the decisions made about how those institutional futures uh, will play out will deeply affect this issue. Um, not everything about the problem of economic inequality is something that the Supreme Court can address, but substantial aspects of that problem uh, are one way or another reflected in the court's cases. Uh, very substantial parts of that problem are reflected in either the attention or the inattention given to them um, by the policies driven by the White House uh, and the legislation taken up or not taken up by the Congress. And so this is an especially important year to take up this issue. Um, as we've heard already, um, and is, is, as is familiar, uh, in an economy of increasing inequality, uh, women bear the brunt disproportionately of that inequality. And within that basic fact, um, it is even more true even more problematic in that sense that women of color uh, experience economic inequality in, in even more dramatic ways. The familiar statistic as mentioned of, of women making 79 cents on the dollar to men um, is worse, significantly worse when we look at uh, the ratio for black and Hispanic women. Um, so much worse that it's really hard to imagine any responsible advanced democracy attempting to do anything other than apologize for the, for the disparity and immediately to set about the work to address it. And one hopes that uh, this summit will be part of galvanizing uh, more attention to the problem and yielding not just talk but action. I think that's what we do here at this law school. Um, is we, we marry theory and practice and produce, produce results. Now this is a school that has a long history of encouraging and enabling women's leadership in the law and beyond. We often recite, I often recite, um, that NYU began admitting women to our JD program in 1890, which is 18 years before Yale, 37 before Columbia, and 60 before Harvard. But who's counting? Um, <laughs> we've graduated many women's rights pioneers from Rosalie, Rosalie Lowe Whitney, class of 1895, who was the first woman lawyer to try a case before the New York Supreme Court, and later the first woman attorney in chief for the Legal Aid Society. Uh, to the late Judge Judith Kay, class of 1962, who of course, among her many distinctions, was the first woman chief judge of the state of New York. Uh, now I sometimes pause and make sure that I can answer the question, why do we dwell on institutional points of pride like this? It's not just because that's what deans do, to brag. Um, I think being part of an institution with a history like this means uh, affirming it and therefore recommitting to the reasons that made that history possible. So I recite these things as part of a kind of collective pledge by all of us that NYU will continue to be a place uh, that educates, uh, that helps prepare, and then launches the next many generations of women leaders on issues of special importance to women to be sure, but on issues, all issues, of public policy and law more broadly. Um, that women can be leaders in all of those spaces is beyond dispute. Um, and that NYU law graduates will be central among them, I think is equally inarguable. And so that's our collective pledge, that the leadership of law women uh, continues today and will continue here at NYU. Um, now it's my real pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Caroline Fredrickson. Um, she is currently president of the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, or ACS. She's the author of the recently published book, Under the Bus, How Working Women Are Being Run Over. <coughs> vivid metaphor. Um, before joining ACS, Caroline was the director of the ACLU's Washington Legislative Office. She served also as general counsel and legal director of Merrill Pro-Choice America. And during the Clinton administration, she served as special assistant to the president for legislative affairs. She graduated from Columbia Law School, it happens to the best of us. Um, <laughs> she's really had an illustrious and continues to, continues to have an illustrious career. She's a great example of the possibilities for pursuing social justice and public service and doing so with the benefit of a legal education. We're really grateful to her for being with us to share her insights this morning. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Caroline Fredrickson. Thank you, it's great to see you. Um, I, I can't, uh, 
really improve on the pleasure of being introduced by your wonderful dean. Um, I have to say NYU um, did a great job in hiring the dean, um, and Columbia is all still sad about <laughs> losing him. Um, but anyway, I, I want to say thank you so much um, to all of you um, for coming out today, uh, to the law women um, who have put together an amazing program and one um, that I have to say I am so sorry I cannot stay for. Um, the lineup of speakers is impressive. Uh, they are people who are, many of them, friends of mine, mentors, um, and I just, I commend to all of you um, that you should stay for this, I wish I could, um, but what a, what a great day you have. Um, and I wanna thank um, the ACS chapter and our ACS leadership um, that has worked alongside the law women to put this together. Um, and I would also make a pitch for ACS. I'd love it if all of you became members. We, our chapters across the country work very closely, hand in hand um, with law women, with VALSA, um, with all of the different uh, student, uh, student groups. And um, I think it's a really important um, that we work in coalition as much as we can because uh, there is so, so much to be done. So let me just start um, uh, in, into this sort of topic that, that uh, uh, we are all ad addressing today with a little footnote that um, uh, references what the Dean had to say, which is what a moment we are in. Um, in case anybody hadn't realized, we are at the beginning of a major discussion in this country about the future of the Constitution and our understanding. Uh, this is a moment at which women, workers, low-income people in this country uh, are poised for great change, and I'm hoping in a positive direction. Um, and I'll touch on some of this as we go through, uh, as I go through my, my talk, but just, just to remember that um, I think um, it's, it, it always seems like law students may take this for granted, but unfortunately the rest of the country doesn't always uh, pay attention uh, to the very, very salient fact that we have three branches of government. We may have an election where people are talking about Nevada now. Uh, they're talking about South Carolina endlessly, right? There's, you can't turn on the news without seeing Donald Trump's face, which I have to say makes me turn it off really <laughs> fast. But, but, but there is this whole other issue that is of equal importance, and that is, what is the direction of our courts? Uh, because the Supreme Court particularly, but not exclusively, has a major role in shaping all of these issues that we are talking about. So I don't have to tell you, whole women's health, the Friedrichs case, other issues that are on the docket now um, that will affect women, uh, will affect low-income families incredibly. So. With that, I will start uh, uh, with my talk. Um, uh, this sort of comes out of my book, um, but you know, I, I, people had often asked me, sort of, how did you get started on this process? And you know, in part, it was just sort of a, a, a kind of a revelation in some ways um, about my own family. Um, and when I was in high school, I, I when I was applying for college, I, you know, trying to look at for that essay topic that's going to set you apart that's gonna make you the one that they're gonna to wanna to admit. Um, we've all gone through that, right? And I thought, oh, I had this really cool great-grandmother. I had this really cool great-grandmother. I thought it was exciting. She, she was a, a desperately poor teen in Sweden. Um, and she, she decided um, she was the, the oldest child of taking care of her younger siblings after her mother died. Um, and her siblings all died. Um, and her father, was there, he said, you know, there, there's nothing for you in this country. Go to America. So she, she got on a boat by herself. She sailed to Boston. She didn't speak any English. And she became a scullery maid. She got a job in Back Bay, Beacon Hill. She scrubbed pots. Now, so when I was um, younger, and it's a long time ago, unfortunately, um, <laughs> my family watched upstairs, downstairs. Um, and that was sort of resonated with, I was like, oh, that's sort of like that, I can understand that. She was a maid, she scrubbed pots. Well now, now we actually, so some of you may watch Downton Abbey, right? 
So some things never change. And unfortunately, some things really never change. And so the Daisy character, you know, she's kind of the bottom of the heap. Um, my grandmother, my great grandmother was that. You know, she was just abused. She had a terribly hard life. She was scrubbing pots and pans. Um, and, you know, this is the end of the 19th century, and it wouldn't surprise anybody to know that she didn't get paid a fair wage. She didn't have any rights to pursue wage theft. Uh, she didn't have any protection against sexual harassment. So that story is unfortunately one that, like Downton Abbey, which has reappeared on television, which is really kind of just a new version of Upstairs, Downstairs. We still live with the Matilda Olofsons, except that now her name is Sonia Suarez. And Sonia, Sonia was somebody um, who, she's a, she's a domestic worker. She's a domestic worker in Boston today. She's doing basically what my great grandmother did. Um, and she's a brave woman because she went to testify in front of the Massachusetts State Legislature. And she talked about her life in amazingly similar terms to what my great-grandmother had lived through. So she faced 14-hour days regularly and often more. She'd suffered from sexual harassment and physical abuse. Her wages were stolen from her. She had no recourse. Her, her employers would not let her go to the doctor when she was sick. When she worked those hours well beyond eight hours in a day or 40 hours in a week, she got no overtime pay. And so what is truly shocking for me, and this is what brought me to write the book, is that we're not, we have not been paying attention to the fact that for many women in America, particularly women of color, because those are the people who fill these jobs now, we have not changed very much since the times that my great-grandmother faced well over 100 years ago. Few people know that as we adopted progressive laws that enabled many people to rise above uh, where they were before to improve their wages and their working conditions. We did leave many, many people behind. Per pervasive ideas about race, women, and work played an enormous role in shaping and limiting what work would be considered worthy of protection. So during the New Deal, President Roosevelt, he had to bargain. So I worked on the Hill. I know how this works. They call it sausage making, right? <laughs> You give a little, you get a little. He wanted to pass legislation. You know, obviously those New Deal bills were really important. But he had to bargain. And he bargained with Southern Democrats who were known as the Dixiecrats. And when it came down to it, what they wanted was they wanted the South to stay the same. They wanted the South, which had not changed very much since the Civil War, unfortunately, in the economic structure uh, they wanted their plantations to stay the way they were. And so what they got from President Roosevelt was essentially an exemption for them and for their workers from all of those protections. And pretty much down the line, the entire set of New Deal bills cut out African American and women workers in the South. And so that those workers who were filling certain job categories did not get coverage from minimum wage and overtime laws, were not allowed to join or not protected in their efforts to join a union, and in, initially weren't even covered by Social Security. So you have one senator, uh, one, one member of Congress, whose name was nickname was Cotton, because Cotton is the story of why these exemptions were created, essentially. And so his nickname, nickname Cotton Ed Smith, he talked about how much they resented the changes that had come to the South after the Civil War. And here's a quote from Cotton. And he's talking about a few other pieces of legislation. Anti-lynching, because President Roosevelt was, was proposing an anti-lynching bill, you know, God forbid. Two-thirds rule. This was to strip the South of its overwhelming ability to control the Democratic nominating process. And last of all, he says, this unconscionable, I shall not attempt to use the proper adjective to designate, in my opinion, this bill. And he's talking about the Fair Labor Standards Act. That's the minimum wage and overtime bill. And he says, any man on this floor who has sense enough to read the English language knows that the main object of this bill is by human legislation to overcome the splendid gifts of God to the South. 
So I say this to you because this, if you go back and read the congressional record, which I did, is shocking. It's shocking because this isn't far from the only example of this kind of language. And if you go into the, the, the committee hearings on the Social Security Act and you actually hear members of Congress saying, well, can't we just deny black workers coverage? And someone says, well, you know that the 14th Amendment, actually, that might be unconstitutional. <laughs> and so what they did instead is they thought, okay, so what jobs do they fill? These are the jobs, we'll just carve out those jobs. Now, I think that would still violate the 14th Amendment, but it has never been challenged in that, in that way. So you leaders of the law, you may want to pursue that at some point. But um, in any case, so what happened um, in the context of the New Deal was that these ideas about race and about the natural role of women consisting of caregiving and housekeeping that helped justify legislation that gave rights only to those engaged in real work, mostly white men. And with much of the work in the home having been done by African American women, it was particularly devalued as a legacy of slavery and racial oppression. Domestic labor was even called nigger's work. And as two legal scholars have observed, not surprisingly, the mammy image, a large maternal figure with a headscarf and almost always a wide-toothed grin, persists as the most enduring racial caricature of Af African American women. And so, as we got, move past the New Deal era, the, the exclusions of workers took different forms. And so, in the context of the civil rights laws, barring discrimination in employment, the family leave law, and the recent Affordable Care Act, we also ended up exclu excluding many workers with the primary impact being on women, low-income women of color, um, that were based on the size of the employer. Um, and the history of this um, often is just, people will just assume it's somehow uh, an economic issue, there's somehow a burden and we don't really dig into this smaller business exclusion. But when, again, when you look at the congressional record, you'll see that the actual ex explanation is somewhat different <coughs> from what you might think. So again, so this is, this is during the consideration of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Members of Congress were talking about this terrible burden that would be placed on employers for actually ceasing to discriminate or not being allowed to hire uh, their people in their race or in their gender over others. And there was a Senator Cotton. So as I said, Cotton is a main theme in the history of American labor law. But Senator Cotton, he started trying to explain why he and us, particularly other Southern members, were very resistant to these laws. He said, you know, when a small businessman selects an employee, comes very close to selecting a partner. And when he selects a partner, he comes dangerously close to the situation he faces when he selects a wife. So what this, what he's saying is, you know, it's, it's, it's not, that hard to understand. This was before Loving versus Virginia. These are Southern members of Congress. They're saying we do not want to actually have, I mean this is directed mostly at race, we do not want to actually have to mix in our workplace. Uh, up north where you have bigger factories, you can figure that out on your own and you can segregate within the factory. But essentially, uh, we don't want to have, we don't, we want to protect our right to discriminate. It wasn't about the burden it was about their right to discriminate. So that template, though, has gone unquestioned. And I have to say, my personal experience working on Capitol Hill, I drafted legislation. I drafted a number of pieces of, of legislation dealing with employment discrimination, including one called the Paycheck Fairness Act. And none of us really thought to, to reconsider why is it that we either exclude these job categories, domestic workers, farm workers, and many others, including taxi drivers? You ever thought about that? We can talk about that when we talk about Uber. But, or why is it that we automatically assume that a small business owner can, why is it okay to discriminate? Why, why should we allow that to happen? And in fact, 
Some members of Congress, even during the Civil Rights Act, raised that. Senator Mondale, you know, when he talked, we were talking about the size exemption, he said, I know what this is about and I hate it, but I'm gonna vote for it because I know that's what we need to get done to get this bill passed. But he knew what it was about. He knew what it was about. So we have gone on to pass more legislation, as I said, the Family and Medical Leave Act, the Affordable Care Act, and others that just kind of don't think about it. We don't reconsider the reasons that are somewhat veiled by history now. But when you actually get into the history, you understand why we have done this. So now the implications are particularly uh, affect women and low-income women of color particularly. And then one other piece that I would just put out there because it's a very important part of today's conversation is the fact that we uh, have come out of a 19th century uh, sort of uh, system of labor and employment law that the master-servant relationship is the basis for how we've structured this and all of our benefits come out of that relationship. And so everything is structured on the employee status. And what happens is that vulnerable workers get designated as contractors, independent contractors. And all of a sudden, all of those laws that people worked so hard to pass, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the National Labor Relations Act, the Civil Rights Act, they don't cover them. Not at all. Unless the state or locality has a better, has a better law. So people think that somehow because Uber is an app or calls itself an app, um, that somehow it's a new issue. But for low-income workers and women particularly who've been in a variety of, of positions from cleaning houses to uh, being uh, janitors in big buildings, uh, they've, they've suffered from being designated a contractor for a long time. Uh, I'm glad we have this discussion about Uber because I hope we can broaden it to include all of those other workers who long suffered under those designations and the lack of protection. So, so ultimately, you know, I, I, I was sort of spurred in, into writing my book in, in some ways because there was a lot of conversation about leaning in. So, uh, you know, I thought, okay, well that's interesting and I don't have any objections to it. I think particularly for women who are, are in professional uh, jobs, that, you know, there's, there's, there are a lot of cultural barriers and we can't deny that and, and, and thinking about them and addressing them. But I was concerned that all the conversation about leaning in and kind of you know, building your own self-confidence overlooked the real issues that affect so many more women which deal with structural problems and need policy solutions and not just self-help. So you know, basically the, what, I, you know, what I was interested in talking about in the book was how we have a whole set of <clears throat> labor uh, safety net protections that we assume are available for everyone and yet in fact in many cases are denied to the most vulnerable workers, uh, primarily women and especially women of color. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this all plays out uh, in the issues that we, can, that we tend to deal with it separate, separately um, in our, uh, in, in our uh, discussions. Uh, and so for example, wages. Wages is an issue that gets talked about a lot. As the dean mentioned, women make less than men. So women make somewhere around 78, 79, 80 cents on the dollar. Um, African American women around 71 cents. Latinas, 56 cents. But we don't often talk about why. You know, sir, so what is, okay, so we just, okay, it's, it's something. What is it that causes that uh, wage disparity? Well, about, you know, and, and I recognize Heidi Hartman, who's here from the Institute for Women's Policy Research, an organization that does amazing work. And so I am humble in saying all this because I basically did all my research using the IWPR uh, reports and, and, and so forth and so for which I am ever grateful. Amazing work. But there's, there's something, the wage gap can be broken down into different pieces and, and the estimates uh, would say that about half of that discrepancy, let's say 20 cents on the average more for women of color, is due to what we have designated very neutrally as occupational segregation. Uh, traditional women's jobs that pay less 
even with comparable education and skills than traditional men's jobs. Now, I actually think that's just discrimination in another form. Why is it that a teacher, say, or a nurse should make less than a truck driver or a janitor? Um, but I'll let he Heidi go into that perhaps later on, but we haven't really addressed occupational segregation as a, 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 in, in a legal way, except for a few jurisdictions like Minnesota, which did it for their government employees, Toronto, the European Union, to say that actually there's a discrimination and there should be some kind of a tool. In, in Minnesota, they went through and they analyzed the jobs that women and men fill, and they said, uh, we're actually underpaying women by a fair amount. They made some adjustment. Um, but another big factor of why women make less, women are the lowest paid workers in this country because they fill all those minimum wage jobs. They are two thirds of minimum wage workers. So when we hear about raising the minimum wage, raising the minimum wage is an amazing issue in terms of affecting how women will do in our economy. But two, the, there are three quarters of the women, of the people who earn what's known as the subminimum wage, the tipped wage. Three quarters of those workers are women. Do you know what that is, the subminimum wage? Probably all of you do, but most people don't know that there's still a subminimum wage in this country where people make $2.13 an hour. In theory, tips are supposed to bring that up to the full, the full and very low uh, minimum wage, but that often doesn't happen. And the legal tools are very poor to enable that to happen. But that's unconscionable. $2.13 is unconscionable. But that leaves, so even if we talk about occupational segregation and that women are filling these low wage jobs and traditional women's jobs, there is a, an amount of that discrepancy, about 40%, which doesn't have any explanation except that women are just paid less because they are women. And I would argue that some degree of that is because the women, so many women workers are not protected against discrimination. So if you're working for a smaller company or you are in one of those job categories that's exempted, uh, you, you make less and there's really no recourse. And say the other piece about uh, discrimination of being excluded from the civil rights laws uh, is harassment. Uh, and women in these categories suffer from a whole variety of abuses, sexual and psychological, that affect their ability to earn a fair pay in the long term. They change jobs more frequently, and which affects their earnings and their productivity. In allowing some employers to discriminate, our laws open the doors to sexualize, racialize, and oppressive working environments. It's no surprise that there's reams of data that show that sexual harassment leads to lower wages for women. It has negative consequences, including increased job turnover, higher absenteeism, reduced job satisfaction. And sexual harassment, it's a lot more about power than it is about sex, as we all know, which explains why women who are particularly powerless, because they're single parents who desperately need a wage, or because of their immigration status, or because their lack of education limits their opportunities, they are perfect victims, because either they're not eligible to file a complaint, because they're not covered by the civil rights laws, or because bringing a legal complaint would put them at greater risk of job loss, retaliation, or maybe even deportation. For farm workers, as I mentioned, one of those categories of workers that was excluded from the beginning of the New Deal laws, they face incredible harassment. Now, they are not excluded from the civil rights laws, technically, unless they're working for a small employer, but the enforcement is so weak 80% of female farm workers in one survey stated they've been subjected to sexual harassment that has had very serious consequences for their working life. So one other piece I wanted to mention in terms of the wages is that 
Union membership is one of the critical factors that enabled women to reduce the wage discrepancy to some degree. But there are those categories of workers. I mentioned domestic workers and farm workers, except for the state of California, which adopted its own labor relations law that allows them to join a union. They're excluded. Independent contractors may not join a union. Uh, and that has had a tremendous impact. And I would just uh, flag for you um, the Friedrichs case that is pending in the Supreme Court now that was argued. Uh, that involves public employee unions. And let me just say that of all of the sectors where women have done the best, women and people of color, it's the public employee unions which have worked to reduce wage disparities, have worked to open non-traditional jobs, uh, and, uh, and are now under attack. And I think for this group, you need to pay attention uh, to what's happening to this broad category of workers because the attack on public employee unions is an attack on women. Um, and so I just, I think that case is, uh, we're not quite sure where that's, what's gonna happen with that one right now because um, it looked like it was um, going in a direction where the workers were gonna lose. Um, but I think we may, we may have to wait for a while to find out how that one's gonna come out. So now I wanna just talk briefly about, um, you know, the other piece of the exclusion from the law is how, scheduling happens. So right, so when the, you know, there's oftentimes people think the overtime law, the Fair Labor Standards Act, was about making sure that you get more money if you work a lot of hours. That's such an American idea, right? We all think we're gonna work, 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 especially lawyers, right? But the actual idea was at a time, the Great Depression was a time of incredible unemployment. So the focus was not on making sure that people earn more wages by overtime, the idea was to it was to be a penalty for employers not to overwork people and to hire more workers to distribute the work because the idea was you didn't, you workers wouldn't want to pay time, employers didn't want to pay time and a half. So that was, that's definitely the main incentive for the overtime law. And so, you know, the, 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 the sort of the uh, cor corollary to that is that for the workers who were not covered by the overtime law, they tend to be overworked. And that has happened. Now, I would just say, domestic workers, I'm gonna continue to talk about them because their protections have not come in full force. President Obama has actually moved forward in finally addressing this multi-decade omission of domestic workers. That's home care workers, those are nannies. There are other, uh, other types of workers who have been excluded. Uh, they're still not covered by the National Labor Relations Act, but they should soon be able to at least hope that they might get their minimum wage and overtime. But the regulation has just come into force. So enforcement will be a critical part of this. But up till now, they have had an incredible and sad history of being overworked, often 80 hours a week and more, and this is hard physical labor. Home health workers are dealing with uh, off very sick and disabled elderly populations. They have to clean them and move them um, in and out of their bed into the wheelchair, the, and, and there are things that are, that are really exhausting. And yet, we've trusted them with our most beloved people, our elderly parents or sick relatives, and they do that without even being entitled to a minimum wage. So now the other piece of the, the work hours issue is that many women often don't have enough hours uh, because in our recent Great Recession, many employers uh, followed the trend of moving full-time workers into part-time status. And one of those reasons is because a lot of our laws are dependent on people being full-time workers. So you have to be an employee, you have to be a full-time employee to get benefits under Affordable Care Act, under the Family and Medical Leave Act. And so what's happened is a lot, you know, and the women have been born the particular brunt of this trend. And so, you know, again, Americans uh, seem to take it as a point of pride that we work a lot. Um, I contest that because when it plays out for these Women, they are working a lot. They're, they're not 
Their part-time status does not mean they're working 20 hours a week. Their part-time status means they're working 60 hours a week, but they're doing it at three jobs. Uh, and the dominant group that does that, women, women, and women, often women with children. So I think that is a sort of a juggling work and family that nobody should have to face. And then, of course, you're probably familiar here in New York because you've actually had some legislation to deal with it, with the whole idea of just-in-time scheduling, where to couple those ideas of trying to reduce the employer uh, requirements by reducing the hours that workers have, they've also made it, their work hours very unstable by you know, using scheduling software and algorithms that sort of figure out, like pick a, pick a, a, a retail company, a Gap, or uh, uh, one of the others where they would try and, and, and use the software to determine exactly what the flow of customers was and how they could match that up with the right number of workers. Uh, but that meant for workers, they have to call in every day. Call in every day, not knowing whether they'd have hours or not. Who works in retail? Women. And it's a sector that is, has a high percentage of, of women of color, and it's a very low paid sector. Um, and what happens is that for these women, they'd have to call in. And again, if you're talking about women with children who still, even if they have a partner, are doing most of the work and dealing with the childcare and not to know if you're working or not working on any particular day, it means not only do you have to scramble for childcare, not only do you have to figure out whether you can uh, find a place to leave your child, but you're also not sure whether you're gonna make enough money in that work period to pay your rent, let alone pay for any childcare if you, ha if you have to do so. So, and the other piece of it is of course, um, I think in destabilizing the workforce, it, it, it limits solidarity, makes it harder for workers to get to know each other. Uh, and so, you know, I think that this issue of scheduling is, is a very significant one um, that people don't tend to sort of recognize that it's not, it's, it's, it's a psychological uh, burden as well as a financial one for the workers because the instability makes it so hard to live a normal life. And try looking for a better job. If you have to call in for, to find out if you have a shift every single day, because you always know that the one day that you finally get a great job interview is the day you're gonna have to go in and do a shift. So, uh, you know, I'm just gonna uh, talk very briefly about a couple of other issues. Um, uh, I've already mentioned the Family and Medical Leave Act um, and the fact that we, uh, that it's, it's triggered um, only for larger employers. In this case, it's even larger than the one uh, in, this, in the Civil Rights Act. It's employers of 50 or more employees, and the workers have to have worked a large number of hours uh, the year before, and they have to be full-time. So, and it's unpaid leave. So as a result, we've carved out a huge number of workers. Um, and so 40% uh, 40 40 of private sector workers don't even qualify, I, I mentioned private sector because in the public sector paid leave is pretty much a, a, a typical benefit. But in the private sector, 40% don't even qualify for unpaid leave. And those mostly left out are younger, low-wage women of color. Um, and even those women who are covered often don't take it because if you're a low-wage worker, try going for 12 weeks without earning any money. So they opt out and they don't take their unpaid leave. And I'm not a health researcher, but I can tell you as I was looking at these issues when I was, when I was uh, writing my book, there is, and again, it's totally not surprising, but there are reams of data about what happens to children when their mother, and then hopefully their father spent some time, but if their, their parents are not there for them right away, if they don't have those early uh, opportunities, um, mothers don't learn how to breastfeed, Children don't get vaccinated, let alone have their first doctor visit. Um, so, you know, we would, we would think that in this country, we like to think of ourselves as being uh, the leader of the free world, right? We're, we're the American exception. We're so special. Well, this is an area where I wish we weren't so special. This is American exceptionalism I think we should reject because paid family leave is the norm in every single other developed country, in almost every other country in the world. So when I was doing my research, I think there were two, three other countries besides the United States that had no form of paid uh, family leave, including 
Papua New Guinea and Swaziland. And I'm sorry, but we can do better than that, I think. So right now we have a situation where we have voluntary paid family leave. Voluntary paid family leave is one of those benefits that gets offered to the high earning professionals. And that ironically, of course, those jobs are mostly held by men uh, and white men particularly. Um, so this is an area where I think we need to challenge American exceptionalism. Uh, and I'd rather be in the company of the rest of the world. Uh, and no offense to Papua New Guinea and Swaziland, uh, but I think we are a lot richer um, and we can do better. Um, so the last issue I just want to uh, touch on briefly, and, and one of the reasons I want to mention this is because I was so startled by it when I was doing my research, but childcare in this country. Childcare uh, is something that is a challenge for all Americans, except the most wealthy. Now I don't know, some of you may have children, so you may already be dealing with this, but do you know that the average cost for child childcare is the same as an in-state college tuition. So for those of you who don't have children, I would counsel you, stop getting your venti decaf double <laughs> lattes every day and start putting that money in a piggy bank because uh, that's infant care I'm talking about. So that's starting day one. We're talking 10, 12, $14,000 a year um, and then there's college, right, at some point. So, um, so this is, this is a, you know, another area where we are unfortunately pretty exceptional. But as I would mention, I have some hope here. Um, and this is why you know, the, the, my research was, was so interesting to me. But so we did actually have a moment where Congress, do you remember Congress? They're that highly dysfunctional group of people that don't do anything, right? So Congress passed a law during the 70s. In the early 70s, they passed universal child care. Universal child care passed by Congress. And I, it's true. I know you probably don't believe me. I couldn't believe it myself. Um, but um, I double checked and triple checked. And yes, in fact, Congress passed this law. Um, but unfortunately, at the time, it was right around the time the Equal Rights Act um, was being debated, the Equal Rights Act, which also came very close to passage. But in the context of the debate around the Equal Rights Act, there arose this group of, of, of fighters for the traditional family led by um, Phyllis Schlafly, who many of you may have never heard of. Um, but she was this sort of general in this anti-feminist army. She led the Stop ERA uh, coalition. Well, she, when she saw the possibility of universal child care, uh, she was inflamed. And so she rallied her troops by describing how horrible it would be if the United States had a child care system. And she said, we realized if we didn't get out and defend our values, this little feminist pressure group, which so little that it actually got Congress to pass the law, they were gonna end up changing our schools our laws, our textbooks, our constitution, our military, everything, and end up taking our husbands' jobs away. And beyond that, children were gonna join unions, they were gonna demand higher allowances, and all the world was gonna change, go to hell in handbasket, right? So she, she fought this, and she and her people got to President Nixon, and he vetoed that legislation. And so, um, but we have a precedent, right? And, and this is of all issues that I think we need to deal with as a society and as people who care about the status of women in this country, this is probably the most profound issue because certainly on a sort of just a, a instrumental basis, having care for children provided that's affordable and is actually safe, which is another big issue in this country, um, will make women able to make choices more easily about the direction they pursue in their life. But let's also think about our moral obligation to those children. Um, in the research, I found that our Department of Labor, which collects uh, reams of research about different kinds of arrangements for childcare, has a, ca a category called self-care. So you know what that means. We have allowed 
that situation in this country, that self-care is actually a government-described category for parents who just simply cannot afford childcare and but have to work. I don't condemn those parents, but I condemn us for letting that happen. You remember last year, a couple of years ago, a woman was arrested in North Carolina for leaving her child in the park outside of her McDonald's. You know, she got a, a, arrested for child abuse, child neglect. Well, what good is that gonna do? She was trying to take care of her child. She'd look out the window, she'd go every break, she'd make sure that, but instead her child goes into foster care and she goes into the criminal justice system. And that's not a solution that I think any of us can rely on. So where does that bring us? Well, for me, I, I have come through, a, you know, my history is one where I've worked on both economic justice issues and worker rights, as well as women and reproductive issues and civil rights. And I don't think we can ever disentangle, or nor should we, those issues. That if we care about economic inequality, um, and groups like Occupy have done quite a lot to bring these issues to the fore, well, we actually need to address the situation of women. Primarily, women are, I think, the canary in the coal mine. They are the future for us if we want to eliminate economic disparity because it's no surprise that, you know, when you look at the 99%, right, we got at least 50% are women. Uh, and together, I think, when we look at these issues and we join and we understand that we can no longer accept the designation of issues like childcare and family leave and fair pay for women as kind of marginal women's issues, soft. These are hardcore economic issues. And we need to put them on the same agenda as we talk about macroeconomic policy and fiscal policy. And we need to push back when those issues somehow don't describe get described with the equal seriousness and attention uh, that we address to issues like what's going on in Iraq or Syria. Uh, for me, I, I think, and I hope for all of you, um, this is a fight, um, and this is a significant, uh, I think, uh, place for all of us to join together and push back to put these on the center stage. So I do want to say I am also hopeful, not only in the, that we have actually done some things in the past that we didn't quite follow through, but that we have a moment now where we have presidential candidates who are talking about family leave, child care, fair pay, anti-discrimination efforts as, as important as anything else that should be on the national agenda. Um, so I do once again want to thank all of you um, for coming, for hearing me out. Um, and for all that um, I look forward to seeing you accomplish. Um, I, I always have a special joy in talking to law students because it reminds me that there's so much to hope for in this country, that there is so much opportunity for change. And I don't mean to put a lot of burden, big burden on your shoulders, but I am because <laughs> it's your moment. Um, and you are the change um, that we are all hoping for. So thank you again. Thank you to the law women and the ACS folks, um, and thank you to NYU for having me, and thank all of you for, for coming today. Wonderful and exactly the start to the day that we were hoping for when you would come. Uh, it is so important that we challenge not just the existing policies, but our entire framework for these policies. And I think Caroline just gave a wonderful example of how some of our baseline assumptions about what we ought to be legislating on are guided by sexist and racist uh, precedent. And so we really need to look at the foundations. Uh, and that's what we're planning to do for the rest of the day. Uh, right now we have a lunch, uh, generously sponsored by Kirkland and Ellis, that we welcome you all to join, and then we will kick off with our panels. 
uh, starting with tax and fiscal policy. Uh, and there's a schedule in the back so you can all take a look. We look forward to the conversation continuing. Thank you so much again. And buy, buy the book. It's out in the lobby. Uh, it's an incredible read. Uh, and we'll give you a lot more detail on exactly uh, what the issues have been in the past and what we can look for in the future. And it's signed. So thank you again. Thank you.